When the Celtic people are mentioned, we think of images of painted warriors and mysterious druids, and a defeated warlord knelt before the might of the Roman eagle. It might remind one of the rolling hills of Wales, the rugged highlands of Scotland, or the Moa Cliffs of Ireland, where echoes of their ancient languages are still spoken today. Shared Celtic heritage is still dear to tens of millions of people worldwide. But who exactly were the ancient Celts? Welcome to our new series covering a 1,500 year historical span of Europe's most enigmatic peoples. The sponsor of this video, Dungeon Fog, was kind enough to create Celtic themed assets on its platform just for this video. So, what is Dungeon Fog? It's a free online map maker and authoring tool created by dedicated gamers of tabletop RPGs for other players and game masters. Their goal is to help fellow players and game masters, and thanks to this innovative tool, game masters and players can save hours of valuable time planning their adventures. The cloud-based platform dynamically generates game master notes based on maps that are drawn with its online editor. Dungeon Fog also allows RPG enthusiasts to share maps with friends and the community, invite other players to join their game and play maps they have created, and print, download or export maps with GM notes. The online editor makes it possible to draw beautiful buildings, rooms, dungeons and more. The maps can be created in a range of settings like fantasy, sci-fi and dystopian to name a few. There are also over 3000 preset choices for props, filters and textures, with the option for GMs to upload their own. Based on what the GM draws, comprehensive, fully editable notes are dynamically generated, including everything from room descriptions to traps and secret treasures. Dungeon Fog can be useful for writers and other creatives, as it can help in visualizing your projects. So support your passion and use this awesome tool by clicking the link in the description. Don't forget that these ads support our channel and allow us to continue our work. For the most part, the ancient Celts left virtually no written records of their own existence, so we are reliant almost solely on limited archaeological and etymological evidence to piece together their culture. While in the centuries leading up to the birth of Christ, a scattering of Greek and Roman writings give us a slightly more dynamic window into their society. Neither offer a complete survey of the Celtic world, but they provide us with a workable set of information that, in lieu of anything else, we have no choice but to rely on. The most popular narrative of the Celtic Genesis can be found in the town of Hallstatt, which sits nestled against a lake between the idyllic peaks of the Alps. It was here, between the years of 1846 and 1863, that an Austrian mine operator known as Johann Georg Ramsauer excavated the derelict cemetery of an ancient salt mining community. The material culture discovered here was named the Hallstatt culture after the town it was discovered in, and is widely considered to be the birthplace of an early Celtic society. The Hallstatt culture has since been broken up into four chronological phases, based on the evolution of artifacts found in its sites. Hallstatt A and B emerged in the Late Bronze Age between 1200 to 800 BC in Central Europe. It was initially a minor deviation of the Indo-European Urnfield complex, an older material culture prominent across much of Central Europe. Hallstatt's society was based on mining salt, copper and tin and trading them to outlying regions. These were crucial products, for salt was used to preserve meat in winters, while copper and tin were used to forge bronze, the most precious metal of the era. The peoples of the Hallstatt heartland grew prosperous from this trade, which remained a core part of their economy for centuries to come. Around 800 BC, ironworking was introduced to the Hallstatt through trade with the Hittites and Greeks. This started the Hallstatt C era, where the Proto-Celts came into their own as a culture distinct from the Urnfield complex. They built hill forts throughout Central Europe, populating them with artisans and warriors led by petty chieftains. It was at this point in the early Iron Age that they started developing a class system and social inequality, becoming more hierarchical. Graves excavated from the Hallstatt A and B eras were uniformly simple and egalitarian in nature. However, burials from Hallstatt C onwards show a great disparity in wealth and status. Clustered around their hill forts were great barrow mounds, the resting place of wealthy tribal elites. 
Here, nobles were buried alongside their treasures such as collars, brooches, axe heads, and other metalworks of bronze, iron, and gold. These valuables oft featured iconic geometric designs and animalistic motifs. The presence of ivory and amber in these barrows suggests that they maintained trade networks that extended as far out as the Baltics and North Africa. Equestrianism was likely a symbol of power and nobility during this era, evidenced by the presence of a distinct style of slender slashing sword present in many graves, best suited for cavalry warfare. Additionally, the highest tribal elites were buried alongside ceremonial bridles, tackles, and ornate horse-drawn colt wagons. The importance of the horse in aristocratic society was likely due to contact with the Indo-Iranian Khmerians, from whom they adapted the horse and wagon as symbols of tribal power. It was perhaps through the mobility of the horse and their economic and cultural soft power that the Hallstatt peoples expanded out of their traditional heartland and exported their cultural influence across much of Central Europe. The transition from Hallstatt C to D occurred around 600 BC and was marked by the culture shifting west along the Danube, Rhine and Seine rivers, gravitating towards the Greek colony of Massalia, modern Marseille. The Phocian Greeks of Massalia were the early Celts' gateway to the riches of the Mediterranean world. Through them they imported all sorts of southern luxuries, including fine pottery, glass, and the most precious luxury of all, wine. Late Hallstatt peoples soon began trading with other Mediterranean peoples, including the Phoenicians and the Etruscans, whose advanced civilization we've covered in a previous episode. The first historical mention of the Celts came in 517 BC from the Greek historian Hecateus of Miletus, who referred to the people living beyond Massalia as Keltoi. This word was possibly borrowed from a tribal endonym, or was Greek for the tall ones, contributing to the enduring stereotype that the average Celt stood a head taller than their Greco-Roman counterparts. Either way, it is a term that we still use today. Late Hallstatt chieftains consolidated a great amount of power by virtue of the foreign wealth they controlled. The many small hill forts that dotted the landscape were largely replaced by fewer but larger population centers, such as the ruins of an impressive tribal complex at Hoenneburg in southern Germany. Meanwhile, the Barrow Mounds became more splendorous than ever before, inlaid with luxury imports from Greece and Etruria. By around 500 BC, the Hallstatt culture had reached its peak in wealth, territory, and influence. But how can we be sure that the Hallstatt material complex represents the early development of a distinct Celtic culture? First of all, the swords found in late Hallstatt graves closely resemble the weaponry that Greco-Roman writers described the Celts using in later centuries. Secondly, the importance of the symbolic horse and wagon in burials was considered an early form of later Celtic funeral rites, which saw chieftains buried within two-wheeled war chariots. The geometric and animalistic art style of the late Hallstatt era is accepted to be an early form of Celtic artwork, and perhaps most importantly, the name Hallstatt itself is derived from an old Celtic word meaning salt place. This is reinforced by the fact that in the Celtic languages of Welsh, Cornish and Breton, the words for salt are Halwyn, Haloin, and Holain, presumably cognates of the same ancient root as the ancient word from which the name of the modern town of Hallstatt is derived. The evidence all seems to suggest that the Hallstatt heartland was where the Celts emerged as a visible people group, featuring an early form of the Celtic language, tribal hierarchy, and artistic expression. However, this theory has its problems. Although by the late Hallstatt period, artifacts belonging to the culture would be found from Britain to Croatia, it did not mean that all the peoples in these lands were early Celts. Additionally, not all Celtic speakers in the early Iron Age would have belonged to the Hallstatt culture. The early Celtic language that became associated with the Hallstatt heartland developed out of an older Indo-European tongue around 1500 BC, and over centuries spread across much of Central and Western Europe. People on the periphery of the early Celtic world adopted the proto-Celtic tongue due to the cultural and economic influence of the Hallstatt elites, but did not necessarily adopt the material culture. For example, 
Ireland and parts of Spain were predominantly Celtic-speaking by the 5th century BC, but the Celtic migrants there had mixed with the indigenous populations of those regions to form the Celt-Iberian and Gaelic cultures, which had little to no cultural continuity with the Hallstatt complex. Basically, there were those who followed the Hallstatt culture who were not Celtic-speaking, and Celtic-speaking peoples who were not of the Hallstatt culture. The prosperous world of the Hallstatt chieftains came to a sudden end around 450 BC, when the increasingly imperialistic Massalian Greeks decided to abandon their old trade connections to instead try and subjugate the Celts, while the Etruscans shifted their trade routes away from the Hallstatt heartland. As a result, Celtic power shifted to the north, evolving into Hallstatt's dynamic successor, the Laten. The Laten culture lasted from around 450 to 50 BC, and is the most iconic era of ancient Celtic history. Developing in four separate tribal centres, principally along the Moselle and Marne rivers, it soon expanded across much of Europe. By 300 BC, the Laten culture was dominant across Central Europe, France, Luxembourg, Belgium and Switzerland, and later would arrive in Britain, Western Spain and Ireland. Laten artwork was what the conventional mind considers quintessentially Celtic, featuring cauldrons, drinking vessels, weapons, shields, armour and jewellery, characterised by stylistic spiral patterns. It is here we slowly transition from relying primarily on archaeological finds and into the written attestations of classical Greek and Roman authors, who while often biased or misinformed, still give us a workable amount of information in piecing together the Celtic world, its language, politics, society and religion. The general public may be familiar with the word Gaul, a term often used to refer to the Celts of the Latin world. This title comes from the old Germanic Valhas, meaning foreigner, which the Celts certainly would have been in the eyes of the ancient Germanic tribes. Meanwhile, when a young Roman Republic encountered the Latin Celts across the Alps in northern Italy, they referred to them as Galli, which might have been the name of an individual tribe they applied to the entire ethno-cultural group. We will use the words Gaul, Gallic and Celtic interchangeably, but generally this was not how the peoples in question referred to themselves. Indeed, a common misconception is that there was ever a linguistically or culturally uniform nation of Gallic people. By the Latin period, Celtic languages had diverged drastically from one another. The main split were the P-Celtic languages, spoken across north-central continental Europe and modern Britain, and Q-Celtic, the more lexically conservative tongues spoken by the Gaels of Ireland and probably the Celtiberians of Spain. This split can still be observed today in the modern Welsh and Irish languages, which are mutually unintelligible due to belonging to the P and Q subgroups respectively. It is unlikely that the speakers of their ancient counterparts would see any common ground between themselves. Gaels and Celtiberians aside, the Gauls of the continent and Britons of the Isle to their north were perpetually a politically divided people. The main form of social organization in the Celtic world was the tribe, ruled by a hereditary chief and his warrior aristocracy. A chief's lands were further subdivided into administrative districts called pagi, governed by lesser houses loyal to the chieftaincy in a system similar to feudalism. Mainly through Roman records, we know that some notable tribes that existed in the Late Iron Age include the Helvetii, Senones, Veneti and Tectosagis. Some names live on even today, such as the Belgae, who give their name to modern Belgium, or the Parisii, for whom the city of Paris is named. Still, the Gaulish peoples likely acknowledged elements of a common culture that was shared beyond tribal lines. One constant was the social hierarchy. At the top of the pyramid was the chieftain, who like his Hallstatt ancestors, ruled rural communities from a hill fort, which were constructed with timber lace and stone ramparts the Romans called Murus Gallicus. Under the chief was an elite aristocracy of warrior nobles. Next were craftsmen, mostly consisting of skilled metallurgists who lived in and around the chief's hill fort, supplying the warriors with arms and armour. 90% of Gallic society were subsistence farmers, providing a portion of their production to their chief, 
who used it to maintain his warrior aristocracy, which in turn protected the farmers from external enemies in a mutualistic relationship. Wheat, barley, beans, oats and peas made up the Gallic diet, while sheep, pigs and cattle were commonly raised for wool, meat and milk. In the south of France, the Celts cultivated grapes and olives. Rather than being a primitive naturalistic people as common perception implies, the Gauls were actually highly developed, with plows, iron shares and cultures able to efficiently till even the heaviest soils. Most Gauls lived in small, rural communities, in rectangular houses of timber, wattle, daub and clay, well insulated for cold winters. In Britain, Ireland and northwestern Spain, homes were mainly circular and built on unmortared stone. Architecture differed little between the social classes, though the feasting hall of a warrior aristocrat would be larger than a peasant's sheep farm. Greek and Roman writings and sculptures have given us a romanticized image of the average Gaul as a towering red-maned noble savage sporting a manly moustache while painted head to toe in terrifying war paint. In reality, the average Gaulish man would not have been much taller than the average Roman or Greek. While fashion differed from region to region, the Gauls tended to dress conservatively. Men generally wore long-sleeved tunics and baggy trousers woven from flax and wool. Women tended to wear long dresses, while both sexes were often draped in cloaks decorated with colourful plaid patterns rendered from natural dyes of copper, berries, plants and stale urine. Personal grooming was highly important to the Celts. For example, both sexes were said to meticulously and painfully pluck all their body hairs. Additionally, there is some truth to the stereotype of the thick Gallic moustache. Depicted often in both Celtic and Greco-Roman iconography, it was likely believed to be a sign of manhood and virility. Gallic warriors were also said to have washed their hair in a mixture of slaked lime and water, which stiffened it into white spikes. Tattoos and skin dyes were not practiced by continental Gauls, and were limited mainly to the ancient Britons, who according to Roman accounts, rendered a bluish dye from the Asatis tinctoria flower called woad, which when applied to their flesh was said to provide magic protection in battle. Often of cultural or spiritual significance, jewelry was common among the upper classes. The brooch, a fastener for a cloak, was a remarkably enduring characteristic of Celtic fashion for centuries. Bracelets and arm rings were common, fashioned in the ornate swirling style characteristic of Latin art. The torque, a weight metal neck ring, was a symbol of status and rank, said to bestow the protection of the gods to whoever wore it. On that note, we should take a moment to explore the religion of the ancient Celts. There are two major misconceptions of ancient Celtic polytheism one perpetuated by modern neo-pagan groups, who often portray the ancient Celtic faith as a pure idealized form of proto-environmentalist nature worship, and one perpetuated by the ancient Romans, who sought to portray the Celts as backwards barbarians. The Gaulish gods did not belong to an ordered pantheon, and religion across the Celtic world was not uniform. Today we know of over 400 Gallic deities, most being the holy patron of a single tribe, or a local god associated with a certain area, like Sequana, who was worshipped only at the mouth of the river Seine. However, there are a handful of gods who were prominent across the Celtic world. These would include the thunder-wielding Taranis, Mappanos, the god of youth, Bellinus, the sun god, Kenanos, the horned one, Epona, the horse goddess, and Tutatis, the warlike tribal protector. One of their most popular gods was Lug, patron of business, trade and technology, dismantling the misconception that Celtic polytheism was purely naturalistic. Celtic religious rites were rigidly structured and not unlike the Olympian religion when it came to sacrifice and divination. It was facilitated by a class of professional priests, the Druids. Today, the Druids conjure up a popular image of mysterious, long-bearded elders in white robes. However, they actually wielded massive political influence, often serving as peacemakers and diplomats on behalf of their chieftains, mediating legal matters, serving as healers and heading education in their tribe. 
Training in order to become a druid involved an intense 20-year regimen in which a dedicant had to memorize a massive array of oral histories, lore, medicinal knowledge, astronomy, religious rituals, and divination practices. Meanwhile, magic potions that bestow superhuman strength on their drinkers are regrettably absent from druidic historiography. The druids likely belonged to a common order that existed beyond tribal lines. They hosted a pan-Gaulish meeting each year among the forests of the Carnites, sacred ground where major political or religious issues were settled between tribes, making them a key vehicle in maintaining a common identity among the many tribes. One of the key duties of a druid was to officiate sacrifices to the gods. Human sacrifice is often described as a core part of Celtic ritual. According to the Roman author Lucan, different gods called for different forms of ritual slaughter. Tutasis' victims were drowned in a vat of water, while Taranis called for men to be beheaded or burned alive in giant effigies of straw. According to the Greek historian Diodorus, human victims were also sacrificed for the purposes of divination. The Druids never wrote anything down, keeping their knowledge a secret restricted to members of their order. We will never have their own accounts of their religious rites, while the Roman authors who wrote about these practices had a vested interest in making their Celtic enemies look savage and barbarous. We can't deny the existence of human sacrifice, but we should also keep in mind the limited perspective that modern scholars have been offered on the subject. In the next episode, we will cover the crucial role that warfare and warriors played in ancient Celtic society, exploring the Gallic attacks on the Greco-Roman world, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.